Hi, this is Arun Shunivasa from Texas A&M and this is a brief tutorial which shows how to solve elastoplastic problems using a numerical technique called a convex cutting plane algorithm. Although this is a standalone tutorial, it is best utilized in conjunction with the book Inelasticity of Materials, an Engineering Approach and Practical Guide written by my friend Professor Shivakumar at IIT Madras and myself and published by World Scientific. Well, let's get going with this tutorial. So what is this convex cutting plane algorithm? This is a method that was adapted from convex analysis. Here I'm going to present it as a way to solve particular kinds of ordinary differential equations uh, that is at the heart of elastoplastic materials. This is useful if you want to write your own code for your elastoplastic model or if you want to implement it as part of a numerical software such as Abacus. This is not the only method out there. There are many such much faster algorithms such as certain types of return mapping algorithms which use an exact newton raphson technique. I just want you to get an idea of how these algorithms work. If you want to know more about it, you can go read the book by Simone Hughes on inelasticity. So before we start, let's get a quick review of what we already know about uh, solutions, numerical solutions of ODEs. The core idea is that we are given a differential equation which is of the form y dot equal to f of y. So I am going to mark some of these things so that we have an idea. So this is our differential equation. y can be both uh, either a scalar or a, or a vector and we want to solve this. There are two popular ways to solve these ordinary differential equations. The first one is an explicit method which is exemplified, exemplified by the forward Euler method. What we do is we replace this y dot by y n plus 1 minus y n over delta t and then you will get an explicit scheme that looks like this. The main point about this explicit scheme is that notice that the right hand side involves only y n. You can see that the right hand side involves only y n and so this is a very easy to implement. It is very fast. You do not need to solve any equations. You just have to substitute for y n and you can calculate y n plus 1. But this is not a stable scheme unless delta t is very very small. The other class of problems, or the other class of methods are called implicit methods. A good example is the backward Euler method. What we do is if you compare this to this, you will see the basic difference. Now you have y n plus 1 appearing on both sides. This is very stable. You can take large values for delta t, but it requires a solution of a nonlinear equation. You can see that nonlinear equation right here. You get y n plus 1 is some function of y n plus 1 on both sides. So you get an implicit equation and you will have to use something like a Newton Raphson technique or something like that. Okay, so what are we going to do in this particular case? We are going to adopt a special method for this special class of ODEs. We are going to solve a specific kind of differential algebraic equation. It looks like this. I got a q dot equal to phi of h q comma t and f of q comma t equal to 0. You can think of h that is this thing as the magnitude sorry as the direction of q dot and phi which is this as the magnitude of q dot. So what happens is that I have an explicit equation for the direction of q dot but the magnitude of q dot is given by some kind of an algebraic equation which has to be satisfied. So how are we going to do this? This particular set of equations are related to what we are going to get in elastoplastic materials. Specifically, f is going to become the um, yield function and q is going to be plastic stain and other things and we will see how that works. What we are going to do is the following. We are going to do an iterative method and our iterative scheme is going to look like this. It looks kind of ugly but take a look at it. This is my q 
indicate the guess for Q, this is my update. This is, if you look at this entire right hand side, everything is calculated at Q at the kth guess. So this is actually what is called a, a predictor corrector method. I assume something for Q and then I calculate a new value for Q and keep repeating until it converges or we hope it converges. We can show that it will be convergent provided that certain convexity conditions are satisfied. I am not going to discuss these kinds of conditions, but rest assured that for most elastoplastic problems, this will work. So now let us look at the problem in a much more serious way. Let us look at this approach for elastoplastic material. What are we given? We are given the strain as a function of time. We want to find the plastic strain, the yield strength, the stress, all of these as functions of time. So what are the equations that govern this? We got a lot of equations, so be ready. This is the stress response that tells us that the stress is C times epsilon minus epsilon P, where epsilon is the strain, epsilon P is the plastic strain. We have the yield condition, which tells us that the stress minus alpha, where alpha is called the back stress tensor and K is called the hardening parameter. So this stress minus alpha, the magnitude of that cannot exceed a critical value. So that's what this yield condition says. The flow rule tells us how EP changes and basically this is called the normality flow rule because E dot P is normal to the yield stress, to, I'm sorry, to the yield surface. Then we have hardening rules which tell us how this K, which is the isotropic hardening parameter and alpha change with time. Notice that k dot looks like h of k times magnitude of epsilon dot p, which by substituting using the flow rule and the yield condition, you will get something that looks like this phi, where phi is called the consistency condition or it will be called that phi right there is called the consistency condition uh, or it will be called the equivalent plastic strain depending upon who you talk to uh, and you will see that it shows up again here. The kinematic hardening rule looks like alpha dot equal to C1 alpha times magnitude of epsilon dot P plus C2 times epsilon dot P. C1 and C2 are constants and uh, again by replacing for epsilon dot P you can get some expression which is linear in phi. Notice that this, this and this all of them have phi as a parameter. The last condition tells us how to find phi. And these are called the kuhn tucker conditions or the consistency conditions and they say that phi have to be greater than or equal to 0. F has to be less than or equal to 0. Of course, F is the yield condition. So that has to be less than or equal to 0. But one of them has to be 0. What it tells us is you can only get plastic flow if F is 0. That is as long as the yield condition is met. If F is not 0, then there will be no plastic flow. This is why we call it the consistency condition. Now you can see that this is a fairly complex set of equations and we have to be able to find them. The only thing that we know is this value, epsilon of t. We do not know epsilon p, we do not know kappa, we do not know alpha, I'm sorry, we do not know their rates. We have to calculate them and using that we have to be able to find the stress as a function of time. So this is a fairly complex set of equations. So what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? Well, our trick is we are going to write the equations in a useful and compact form by eliminating the stresses. Then, and we will write it in this form, q dot equal to phi of h, f of q comma t is less than or equal to 0. This is what we are going to write it as. You will see that gradually we are getting, to, getting it into a differential equation form that looks familiar. Then we will derive the algorithm for solving this particular differential equation. Then we'll show how to implement this. What I mean by that is I'll give you a flow chart. You can directly implement this uh, uh, with any kind of software if you like. And you will be asked some questions so that you can see whether you have learned this material or not. So this is going to be our four step problem. So let's start part one. We are going to rewrite the elastoplastic equations in a compact way. We already know that for an elastoplasticity problem, we have the following set of equations which we are going to group into two parts. The stress response and the yield condition, notice that there is no time rate of change in any of this. So 
So there's no time rate of change here. There is no time rate of change here. So these are the two, this is the first group. The second group contains all the evolution equations. Notice that all of them have time rates of changes. We got epsilon dot p, kappa dot, alpha dot, and then we have phi, which is something that connects up the first part with the second part. So that's, I have just recapped this thing again so that you can take a look at it. What we are going to do is we are going to group the terms. Now this is, we are not going to group all the terms and convert it into a gigantic 13 by 1 column vector. So it's going to look like this, q equals this huge column vector, but I want you to not worry about it. This whole part is epsilon p, there is kappa, that is the seventh location, then this whole part is alpha. So I have just written epsilon p, kappa and alpha in as a column vector. If you look at our original equations, the q dot terms will have, can also be written as a column vector. Now these are our constant equations for how this q changes. You will see that it again looks very ugly, but this part is nothing but the normality rule. This is the isotropic hardening. This is the kinematic hardening. It contains everything other than the phi. You can think of this as the constant equations for the direction of q dot. The magnitude of q dot will be determined separately, but this is the constant equation for the direction of q dot. What I want you to observe is that in H, everything is a function of the Q's and the stress. Okay, so what about this? You will see that this is a major step because now you can do something that's very, very nice. We can eliminate the stress and we can rewrite the equations. I should not have said this is not F, this is sigma, that was a typo, so that's sigma. So, the stress is a function of the strain and Q. Q dot is, a, is phi times H, which we talked about. P is greater than or equal to 0. F of Q comma epsilon of T is less than or equal to phi of F equal to 0. So, this is our now our reduced or cleaned up set. You can see that we are beginning to get a form that looks very, very much like our differential equation. And We already know the stream, so we only need to find Q. As soon as we are able to find Q, we can substitute for Q and we can find the stress. So these are the only two equations that we really care about. We don't really worry about this much, very much, because we are going to eliminate these kinds of things. These two equations are of the form that we want, Q dot equal to phi times h of Q except that we have something that looks kind of funny uh, with all these inequalities, but that's not a big deal. We will show how to solve that. Now, I'm just going to show you the details. Now, this is our constant equation for the deviatoric stress for an isotropic elastoplastic material. You will see that I got 2 mu times gamma. This is the deviatoric strain and epsilon p. If you now look at our H and systematically eliminate the deviatoric stress from it, you will get this. This is again the normality rule. This is my hardening law, isotropic hardening law. This is the kinematic hardening. There is nothing special about this. All I want you to be aware of is that wherever there was tau, I have replaced it with gamma minus epsilon p. So now everything is in terms of q and gamma. And gamma, remember, we know, we know epsilon of t, so we know gamma of t. So this is known. Okay, I just wanted to show you that this is what it looks like. 
So now, how are we going to solve this? So the idea is that the method involves a predictor corrector type approach. We are going to make a guess and then correct it in a sequence of steps. steps. But before we do that, we need some notation. The basic idea is the following. We are going to write things, vectors, matrices, things like that in this form. This n and k, n is the time step that tells us at which time we are trying to evaluate. k is a correction step number. So, k0 will correspond to k0 will correspond to the initial guess or predictor and as k tends to infinity, you will gradually get closer and closer and closer to the exact correct answer. So, k tells us the correction number. Okay, we are still going to continue on how to solve it. Let us write down what do we know. We know the values of the variables at time t n. Epsilon n, q n are known. This is known. We know the strain at time t n plus 1 because that is the prescribed thing. So, we know this. What we want to care, what we want to know is q n plus 1 and sigma plus 1. This is what we want to find out. In fact, if I know this, then I can simply use my constant equation to find this. So, this is really at the heart of it. Okay, let us see how we are, how are we going to do this. So, we got to start out this step. So, our idea is to make a guess as to the inelastic variables. So, what are we going to guess? What is the dumbest possible guess I can do? I can just assume that Q does not change. That is, qn plus 1, the 0th step is the same as qn. Well, does our dumb luck hold? Are we still inside the yield surface? What we do is, we check this. We are checking to see if we are inside the yield surface. If the answer is yes, then we are ready to go to the next time step. If the answer is no, then we have to adjust this guess so that we are back into the yield surface. This adjustment of the initial guess is at the essence of this method. Before we plunge into the details, I want to show you a graphical representation of this. So, imagine that our plastic variables are only plastic strain, so that it is easier for us to see. So, that is our strain, plastic strain space. Here is where we are. This is our initial guess for the plastic strain. This is the previous plastic strain step. Now, what I am going to do is I am going to see whether or not I am still inside the yield surface. So, I am going to calculate f. It turns out I calculate f, epsilon p n, which is at 0 time step, epsilon n plus 1, turns out to be greater than 0. So, that means I am outside the actual yield surface. The actual yield surface is here. My correct yield surface, I have to sit on this yield surface but I am right now here. So, I have to do some kind of correction to go from here to here. Let us see what kind of corrections I am going to do. So, I am going to make my initial guess based on where I am right now. I check my yield stress again. Oh, I am still outside. I make another guess. I check again. Oh, I am still outside. I make, I keep making until I lie on the yield surface. So, these are the correction steps. This is my prediction step. So, I gradually, I stop from outside and I go back inside and each of the correction steps, the magnitude and direction have to be decided. That is what we are going to look at next. Okay. So, assume that the corrections equation satisfy the equations, the flow equations, but we are going to use the forward Euler for direction H. So, we are just going to do an explicit scheme for direction h. So, it looks like this. So, we want to satisfy this, but here is my old value, here is my correction and here is my new value. So, remember this is my old guess, this is my correction, here is my new value. Sorry, this has to be a plus not a minus. Notice that 
the correction is calculated at the old value the right hand side of this entire equation of this equation here depends only upon the old values that I already know except delta phi this is the only thing that I do not know yet if I knew this then everything would be the old value now why are we using a forward oiler we just said it was unstable I will give you a heuristic justification it turns out it is deeper than this but just a heuristic justification for this is based on the fact that each represents the direction of the yield surface I am sorry direction of the of the uh, inelastic variables and we do not expect that to change a whole lot but we do expect the magnitude to change so we are going to keep the directions with a forward Euler type of scheme and we are going to use a backward Euler for the magnitude. So what are we going to do we are going to assume that we are going to find the magnitude of the correction delta phi in such a way that the yield condition is satisfied at the end of the time step that is that the corrected value q n plus 1 k plus 1 should be on the yield surface this is our uh, this is our hope well let us see so what I do is I am going to take this substitute it here and then I am going to write it this way you can see all I did was I replaced for q n plus 1 k plus 1 with this if I did that notice that I am sorry this should have been u n plus 1 k this is also k I just took this and substituted it in here notice that this entire thing only delta phi k is unknown q n plus 1 k is known q n plus 1 k is known epsilon n plus 1 is known all of these things are known the only thing that is no unknown is delta phi so our final equation looks like this for delta p if I am able to solve this then I can go back plug it in here and I will get the next time step ok now how are we going to solve that nonlinear equation well we are going to linearize the equation for delta p by using a Taylor series so I know that f of delta p must be 0 I am going to expand it as a Taylor series f when delta phi for any finite value of delta phi is approximately equal to f when delta phi equal to 0 plus delta phi times df d delta phi I evaluated a delta phi equal to 0 this is a pretty straightforward thing if I do the derivative I will get this chain rule you know I have to do chain rule then this is the value this is this and this is all of this so all you have to do is just solve for delta phi you will get a huge mess you will get delta phi equals so notice that if I solve for this take this move it to the right hand side divide by all this junk and you will get delta phi delta phi equals negative of f divided by this whole thing that is what I got here negative of f divided by this whole thing and then once I get that q n plus 1 I can give you an explicit equation for that looks like q n q n plus 1 k plus 1 equal to q n plus 1 k minus f times h both of them evaluated at k divided by d f d q dotted with h both of them evaluated at k the entire right hand side depends only upon k I got an explicit scheme that is it there is nothing more to it it is an extremely trivial situation and one that can be easily programmed and solved the main problem will be calculating this h and df dq and all that but that is just calculus and algebra nothing more than that it is a pain in the neck but such is life ok so I am going to show you the flow chart for doing this so here is our start I am going to put k equal to 0 qk equals qn so this is my first step so qk must be equal to qn epsilon equal to epsilon n plus 1 so what I do is first thing is I calculate and see if my 
f k is less than zero. Am I inside the yield surface? Please do not put zero for tall. Tall stands for tolerance. Don't put zero for that. If you do that, you will never get out of the loop that you they are going to get. You have to put some positive finite number in order for the the iterative scheme to stop. This is a very critical point. So please don't uh, put zero there. Okay. Suppose it is less than tolerance. That means you are either on or inside the yield surface without changing the plastic string and the other inelastic variables. The answer is yes. You just go to the next time step. That's it. On the other hand, if the answer is no, then you have to update QK. This is our update scheme. You have to calculate H as a function of QK comma epsilon. QK plus 1 is QK minus FH divided by DF DQ dotted with H. That's all you have to do. Update K to K plus 1 and then you are done. That's it. Me. It's a trivial kind of setup. I just want you to get used to this idea. Now it's time for you to test yourself. The following things are true or false questions. First, the convex cutting plane algorithm is the only way to solve the ODEs of plasticity. True or false? The algorithm is just a forward Euler scheme. True or false? The value of delta phi is obtained by linearization of a backward Euler scheme. True or false? We showed that the algorithm will converge. True or false? The next set of questions ask you to describe things. So this requires some deeper thought. So my first question for you is, what is the motivation for using the forward Euler scheme for the direction h? of the update. Why did we use a forward Euler scheme? My next question to you is, why did we not use a Runge Kutta or a backward Euler scheme for the whole problem? What aspect of the structure of the elastoplastic equations did we exploit in order to get this particular uh, set of fairly straightforward iterative scheme. The next two questions ask you to do some programming and some calculations. That's why I call it extend. You're going to be extending what I thought about. So the first question is to write a computer program to implement the convex cutting plane algorithm given the following. I'm going to give you isotropic elastic response. I'm going to put Young's modulus is 1. That means I have non-dimensionalized the whole stresses and everything with, with the Young's modulus. The Poisson's ratio is 0 0.3. I am going to assume that the hardening, it is purely isotropic hardening. HFK is 0 0.01 minus K to the power 0 0.3. I just made up something. K0 is 0 0.001. And I am going to assume that alpha is always 0. So you, you are actually, your Q vector will be shorter than uh, 13 units because alpha is going to be always 0. So you can actually neglect the last 6 terms of Q and you can write something that is shorter. So you should be able to implement the flow chart with these, these particular constant equations and you can see the results. The second one is create your own algorithm for the following differential equation. Q dot equal to phi of H, phi equal to F of Q comma T. Notice now I have an explicit equation for phi unlike the previous cases, but yet for many viscoplastic materials, this will be the case. Just doing a forward Euler for the whole thing is not a good idea, but you can do forward Euler for H like what we did, but do something like a linearized backward Euler for P so that you will be able to get something that's quite reasonable and uh, you will get a form that's quite similar to the one that we saw. I'm going to stay silent for a while so that you can copy down the questions that you have and you can try to answer it. And then in the next page I'll have answers but I would strongly urge you to pause this thing right now and try and write down the answers at least the true or false and the described parts so that you can check whether you understood this thing or not.
just write down the questions i don't want you to write down the answers yet but if you write, if you write down the questions that will that will enable you to answer it so i hope you you are able to write down the questions i'll give you another minute Okay. Okay. I'm just going to go to the next part. So here are the answers. So the the first four true or false. First one is false. Second one is false. Third one is true. Fourth one is false. Here's the answers to describe. You can read it. I've written only a very very brief version, just so that you can you can figure out. R K stands for Runge Kutta. B E stands for backward Euler. The main thing is, uh, I've just pointed out the highlights. I hope you got this basic idea. I've kept it really brief so that you can finish it in about half an hour and not more. Uh, the PowerPoint slides will be available so that you can stare at them later. I hope you got the basic idea. Uh, thank you and bye.